someone mentioned to me, uh, and I shan't say who mentioned it. Um, who was it though? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in a lot of trouble if I did actually say it. Yeah. Um, Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. Just to remind you, if you're listening on SoundCloud or iTunes, you can also watch the video on YouTube or on our site and vice versa. If you're watching the video, you can download it on SoundCloud or iTunes. Uh, this week I have with me Jamie Davis as ever. Hello Scott. And the enormous pleasure of Ray Lemaitre, who was conspicuously absent last week, um, from Light Reading. Hi Ray. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this week we're going to be talking about whether 3UK has the right to challenge the 5G auction we're having here. Uh, we're going to ask whether we have any control over our digital lives. And we're also going to ask whether telcos have got a clue about what's going on in their networks. Now, the 3UK one, that's me. So I'll introduce myself. Scott, over to you. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, and I'm going to say that the 3 finally came up with its... Um, I can't remember what the technical term is. Uh, some kind of judicial inquiry or judicial whatever. Judicial review. Review, there we go. Um, into the circumstances of the 5G auction. So just to give everyone a bit of background, a little what three's been banging on about how unfair it is that people like E and Vodafone have got loads more of the UK available useful spectrum um, than it has. And it's had this bizarre campaign, hashtag make the air fair and all that sort of thing. It even did a cartoon. Super Sharon, yeah. Yeah, even did a cartoon of the of the head of Ofcom, Sharon White, in, in some kind of absurd superhero uniform, somehow imploring her to save the day. Um, and by save, by save the day, they basically mean force everyone else to give three some more spectrum. Or, now, to, or stop and don't allow them to buy any more spectrum. Don't allow them to buy any more. Uh, and, and that takes the form of uh, what it would like to be is an absolute cap on the amount of spectrum that any one operator can own in the UK. And it wanted that cap to be 30%. Right now, I think EE has about 42% or something like that. Yeah. So obviously, that requires a fair bit of redistribution. I called it spectrum socialism in the story I wrote a little while ago. Fair bit of redistribution from EE to three. And what goes unsaid is, is O2 as well, which has a similar amount, about 15% of the spectrum. And obviously, he didn't think this was a good idea. Um, and Vodaf in, Vodafone kicked up a fuss as well. Vodafone kicked up a bit of a fuss. Can't remember in what direction I their think fuss they, was kicked. They're, they're over the spectrum cap as well. So yeah, they, a little bit. They're, yeah, yeah, they're about 34 35%, I think, Something isn't like that. it? So yeah. yeah. So they weren't happy. Uh, and... And Ofcom, as the arbiter of these things, was forced to make a call, and they went, all right, we're going to cap it at 37%. Um, and you'd think that was a sort of happy little medium, but, you know, 3 obviously wasn't happy because it didn't get 30%. E wasn't really that happy because it means it can't get more spectrum, certainly in, in one round of auctions. Um, and, uh, and and that's fine. That's going to happen. When, you, when you've got to adjudicate, when you've got to meet in the middle, you can't please all the people all the time. But now what's happened is that 3... Um, He's taking it to to the courts and challenging the decision. Now, the big criticism of that, you'd think, fair enough, if they're not happy, do something about it. And you could say that. It certainly beats drawing silly cartoons. Um, but the the major briefing that the likes of Ofcom um, are having against this is it's going to delay the whole 5G process in the, in the UK and thus basically put us behind the whole world and relegate us to back to the sort of medieval times or whatever. So, um, yeah, our, our angle, Jamie, your angle, generally when you've been writing about three and it's moaning, hasn't been massively sympathetic, has it? No, no, I mean, I, I've got no sympathy for them. I've got sympathy for challenger brands who come in and are struggling against the incumbents, um, you know, because the, the, the financial weight of, let's say, let's, let's have a look at a hypothetical situation. Three come into the UK market and the financial weight of BTE slash EE and Vodafone and O2 meant that they couldn't compete. Yep. Now, in that situation, I would have sympathy for them. And I think, yeah, OK, the, there should be a bit of encouragement from the regulator to help them you yep. know, level the playing fields. But, As I believe there was. Yeah, but like C.K. Hutchison, or where, mm -hmm. where, however you pronounce it, from Hong Kong, is a multi-billion pound uh, or Hong Kong dollar business, yep. which is one. He's you know the guy who owns it is one of the richest guys yeah. in the world. Sure they make above. they make ridiculous amounts of money. So the fact that three can't compete financially is because they're not funding it. Yep. I mean they they have the money 
to compete on a financial so footing at out. the Spectrum, yeah. but they at the Spectrum auction, but it just looks like they don't want to. Um, and the other, I mean, three, you know, they just they're just constantly complaining. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. They're like it's like that guy down the pub who just never has a good day. <laughs> You know, you say, oh, how's your week been? Uh, you know, it's all right. <laughs> you know, it's a bit wet. All oh, right, okay. Middle of June, uh, how's your week been? Uh, well, you know, it's a bit sweaty on the tube. You know, there's just nothing, there's nothing good about or three. The, uh, or the football fan who every time his team loses, it's because the ref was biased yeah, yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I think there's other, there's other reasons for this review, but, I mean, ultimately, they're trying to... They're trying to skew the regulatory and legislate uh, yeah. and, leg- uh, and sort of like rule makers to favour them. But so, I, sorry, carry on. That's all right. So, so Ray, on the other hand, it can't be fair for one company to have almost three times as much spectrum as the other. What do you think of this whole issue? I think Ofcom has obviously made an initial ruling that has tried to even even things up. Um, three clearly unsatisfied I think now going down the legal route I don't think it's going to do the whole thing about oh this might delay the award of 5G spectrum that's just a red herring I don't think it's going to make any difference whatsoever but all it's going to do I think is ultimately financially penalise three itself it'll end up spending a lot of money I don't think it's going to get anything out of it If there is a, a, a set of judges somewhere that do rule in its favour, there will be appeals and it will open up a whole can of worms of the other companies going, well, let's go and review all of the other processes and see if the judges rule in favour of that. What about that thing back in the 1970s where we got screwed over? Yeah. And it will open up a can of worms. So I think this is not a good route to go down for anybody, in yeah. fact, but including three. So I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. I think one interesting thing that someone mentioned to me, uh, and I shan't say who mentioned it. Um, who was it though? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in a lot of trouble if I did actually say it. Yeah, um, <laughs> but it was uh, it was an off the record comment um, that highlighted the UK broadband acquisition. So basically, the theory is is that UK broadband gives them some leeway in the five G fight. But three hasn't optimized its kit um, to you know for, for that spectrum band that it acquired or the licenses it require, acquired as part of the UK broadband deal. So kicking off this review gives it a little bit more time to optimize the kit so it can actually be 5G ready with the assets it's already require, uh, uh, acquired. It's a massive conspiracy theory. It'll probably never be proved. Be proved false or accurate but you know it's yeah. a nice little well it, it's a nice little I mean, it's, it's consistent it's a green herring <laughs> it's a uh, it's consistent with the general view that um these sorts of challenges are usually not about what they appear to be on the surface it might be something strategic like you were just describing jamie um or it you know it might just be an attempt to acquire bargaining chips in some other few future sort of adjudication or something like that. Um, but uh, what does seem to be clear is that they're not getting much sympathy anywhere. So uh, I th- do you know what I think would be quite a funny thing? If we argue, if we use our little bell thing to argue for and against it, I've got a feeling the argument for it is going to be quite short. In fact, I'm going to give, I'm going to give Ray that privilege. Ray, <laughs> you've got... You've got 30 seconds to argue in favour of Three's judicial review, starting now. I have no fav- I have no argument in favour of Three's yeah, judicial well review. Well I told you it'd be short. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, your argument against it. Well, if you look at uh, all the other legal proceedings that have uh, predated this judicial review, I think that Three is just shooting itself in the foot. So, it, you know, it's uh, it's opening up a can of worms that everyone... No, seriously, I think it's basically um, three are just being moaning. They they don't want to they don't want to contribute money and actually battle on an evil ground. I don't I, don't, I just don't think I think they're just being moany little bastards. <laughs> Steady. Uh, cool. Okay, moving on. 
do we have any control over our digital lives? So, Jamie, you, you, you've been writing about this this week. You went to an event. You've been chatting to various people. So what's going on with our digital lives? Yeah, it's quite... Um, um, so I was at CloudSec earlier this week. And um, it was a really good event, actually. Really enjoyed it. And one of the websites that was really brought to my attention, and I'd recommend everyone having a look at it because it's quite... Um, I didn't realise I'd been breached quite a few times, oh. but it's called, <laughs> so to speak, as you as you do. <laughs> Where's this video going? <laughs> <laughs> so it's called Have I Been? Right, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Have I been pwned? pwned? Yeah. It's owned, but with a p. It's yeah, sort of pwned. Internet speak. Yeah. It's Have I P W N E D dot com, and basically you type in your uh, any email address, and it shows how often that email address has been associated with a breach, and I think. The bigger argument is, or the, the bigger point is, how many people actually have an understanding of their digital footprint and what the digital economy actually means to us as consumers. Yeah. So if we start with the second one, what it means to us as consumers, if you say data is the new oil, algorithms are the new refinery, and our personal information is how we're going to pay for things. So we give away personal information in instead of paying yep. for services, information. How often do you keep track of that information that you're giving away? I mean, for instance, how many apps, that, that I know you're not gonna know this off the top of your head, yep. how many apps have you downloaded for your phone over the last two years? What, Loads. 100? I'm sure you can download an app that would tell you that. <laughs> yeah, you possibly can, possibly can. But, but I mean, my point is, like, I got no idea yeah. I mean, how many times have you downloaded a game, or I've done this quite a few times, realised the game is absolute pony, and then just deleted it straight away? Mm -hmm. But you've basically given your details yeah. for that five minutes to that company. So a lot of people don't know where about their digital footprint because they're just giving their details away willy-nilly, just absolutely everywhere. So everyone's, everyone could be a potential... And why is it bad for us to not be on top of this? I mean, you can have something. I mean, there could be a breach, and you've got no idea that you're involved right. with it. I mean, your details, like a breach, being where where your details are just are leaked onto into, the dark yeah, yeah. web, or, which happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. We just we just had one as we speak, uh, but they seem to happen every day, and they're normally account uh, accompanied by all the the predictable press releases from security companies. <laughs> yeah, but for instance, like if HSBC got breached, I I've got a HSBC bank account. Yeah. If they got breached. You've just I'd given some personal data away there, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> fine. Um, you can you can blank that out, Pierre. Um, <laughs> if they got if they got breached, I'd know about it. But what about some Mickey Mouse little game yeah. developer in the Philippines that I once downloaded a game, and they get breached, and yeah. all of a sudden my personal information there is out, and I've got no control over that because I've got no awareness that they have my personal information. So. EU, EU GDPR, those sorts of things, it gives the consumer more control, but there's just literally no awareness about what our impression on the digital economy is at the moment. Is this uh, is the control over your sort of digital presence something that keeps you awake at night, Ray? Nothing keeps me awake at night, Scott. <laughs> uh, um, no, I think That's it's because of your aggressive drinking habit. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody, uh, apart from the people who've completely cut themselves off from a, any kind of digital lifestyle, I'm not sure anybody really knows how much their inf where their information is stored or how much it's travelled. But even if they do, what we don't know is how that's going to come back and impact our digital lives in one, three, five, ten years' time. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, I joked about you can probably download an app that can tell you where okay. your information is. I mean, that is something I think that everybody, um, you know, should have and it should be freely available and people should be encouraged to have. Because I think it'd be quite shocking for a lot of people to find mm. out where their information is stored or, 
you know how many e- you know how many email accounts they have and what's going on with those accounts i think you know would be a starting point who's got a hotmail account they've forgotten about that's currently yeah. being used to you know um um spam the world with the 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 latest offer of a tw- 20 million um uh, you know bank account in in nigeria or some viagra mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff so i think it's all about uh it's really all about education i think when people sign up to any new service as part of getting the the email to verify there should be information in there about you know do you know about your digital footprint um you know uh, get you can get that information here so that people can become more aware yeah and I, I think there probably should be a bit more of a bit more of an onus on the on the companies themselves to not just make you read a ton of small print which no one does bothers but just sort of maybe update you a bit more and just sort of keep you keep you informed. I mean, my, my biggest thing about this, and when Jamie and I were chatting about it earlier on this week, was you know, people talk a lot about um, your data being new currency and your you know your digital identity being hoarded out by all these big um, internet companies. And obviously, it's not nice to feel that there's some aspect of your sort of public persona that's not within your control. But I also sometimes wonder whether how it affects me. For example, like advertising. So you've got like Google and Facebook make tons of money out of advertising. And they supposedly, by seeing what I do, what I like, by sort of sifting through, using algorithms, sift through my emails, whatever, they can send more targeted ads to me, which is which is how the ad industry supposedly been revolutionized. But I don't see much evidence of it. I don't see certainly nothing predictive. About the best I see is a, a some suddenly get served with an ad for something on Amazon that I just bought. So it's a sort of reactive algorithm rather than proactive. It doesn't seem to be anticipating anything. Um, I suppose it would be a bit scary if it did. And suddenly you find yourself buying all this stuff you didn't know you wanted. But they didn't seem anywhere near doing all that yet. So on that, on that side, I'm pretty, I'm pretty relaxed about it. But you know, Ray made a good point. I think I think one of the things like on Facebook in particular, I think they're pretty they've they've always been pretty good at relating where you are now to sort of like what you might want. So like a, a good example is like a couple of I think last year, one of my mates noted that he or his his partner put engaged on the Facebook profile, and all of a sudden, all the adverts were yeah. dressmakers. But that's still quite rudimentary, isn't it? All yeah. this talk of AI and algorithms and general cleverness. Um, I don't think don't think you've got to be, you know, one of those um, those AI things that beats people at Go or Dota no. Two to work out if someone's engaged. They might want to buy some wedding shit. But you know, there, there you go. But the the point I was just going to make now, um, the Ray said about your sort of digital footprint in the long term. You know, we're in an era where a, a lot of um, people's lives are being affected, often negatively, by something they might have said or done online it's often taken out of context and used to sort of denounce them you know what if one day you signed up to some slightly politically dodgy site or or whatever or even worse you know it became in the public domain what kind of filth you might be looking at online and then but then your online reputation can get properly trashed and you can lose jobs and all that yeah. sort of thing so that's um and i believe me i'm not talking about myself here i'm obviously squeaky clean but for other people it's slightly more sordid on live online existence i'm not looking at anyone in particular here i mean that's part of one of the other things that was brought up there's a, a new website called attorney.me right um now basically you can sign up and there's about 30 odd thousand people that have done this and you sign up and this ai tracker basically just keeps tabs on your social media networks when you die um the ai takes over your online life and creates a virtual you which will never die now that's but it's (laughs) but it's something worth thinking about because like half the time like this I mean, one. Thing, I just thought about it. Yeah, <laughs> but social media accounts. Have you ever thought about what happens to your Facebook page after you die? Like, very few people have. It's not a particularly nice thought. No. But if you do, if someone doesn't think, Can they about start it, spamming you with ads for coffins and stuff. <laughs> no, but, ima- but imagine, like, uh, no one reports that you're that you've died. That is a profile that someone who wants to steal your identity and potentially commit fraud mm. elsewhere in the world which is like you're saying in five to ten years time we'll start to feel the impact of what this is like 
they like that's an authentication tool for a lot of people at the moment a facebook account so yeah. they could that in theory could be used to mm -hmm. you know to to create a new identity and commit fraud and uh, elsewhere in the world mm. so it's all it's all portentous stuff so yeah um to summarize that i my view i'm not generally in favor of trying to sort of impose arbitrary regulation on private companies but maybe if you know these these big internet companies like Facebook and Google make a hell of a lot of money from mining our data, maybe they should be required to take a bit more responsibility for the sort of protection of our digital identities, or at least empowering us more. I think they do it a little bit, you know, they give you all these tools, but whoever goes into Facebook and looks at all those various tools they can do, and you can argue that if you can't be asked to do that, then you deserve to not have any protection, but, but I suspect they could make it easier for us. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we've got one more topic here. Ray wants to talk about dirty data. Actually, I think it was uh, dirty dancing oh, was it? that I said. But then I vetoed it and said, for God's sake, make it relevant to the subject matter. Yeah, well, I mean, I always have the time of my life when I come on this podcast, so um, <laughs> I'm prepared to talk about dirty data. Now, this is a, um, I would say, about 16 or 17 years back, when I had uh, I first went to a, a telecom software um, uh, industry event, and the first person Did I spoke 16 to sixteen or seventeen years. Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> it's, I've got to warn you. Ray, when I was still at school, Jamie is guilty of ageism at times. <laughs> I yeah, I won't tell you sort of what year I was in at that point. <laughs> And that's just when I f that's when they first let me out of the office <laughs> after two decades. <laughs> but um, and the first person I spoke to. Um, uh, was about the topic of uh, dirty data, uh, how accurate the information is that network operators hold on their networks right. and how much they actually know about their networks. And certainly, you know, in the early 2000s, the consensus was that some operators really had only about 50% accuracy about the information about their networks and that the ones who were really on top of it might have 80 to 85% accuracy. Right. Uh, so I think over the years things have got better with the introduction of uh, IP uh, networks and, and the deployment of new networks. That's enabled companies to, um, uh, to get a, a, a better handle uh, on, on the information, just knowing what they've got hooked up um, you know, uh, in different parts of their network. But also, you know, if you've got a 16-port um, a uh, bit of kit, how many of those ports are live and being used and what they're actually set up for, all this kind of information. Now, if you consider the current trend around virtualization and particularly the move towards autonomous networks yeah. where you're going to let software decide how the networks are configured and how yeah. the services are set up, well, if you haven't got accurate information about your networks, how you... How is a piece of software Indeed. using inaccurate information going to set up the right services for the right customers with all the right information? It's not going to happen. So yeah. I think we are about to hit a new era of concern or scrambling by the network operators trying to figure out, do we actually know what we've got and how do we go about convincing ourselves even that we have... 100% accurate information about our network because at the moment a lot of operators that I mean they don't and they employ vendors to manually go and visit their points of present in their network and go and test every single bit right. of gear to find out what's there and what's working so hold on operators over promising Shut the front door. I mean, that can't be happening. I mean, how do you mean over promising? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they, they. It sounds like they're overreaching. They, they. You know, they've got this idea, but they haven't got the fundamentals in place you to actually facilitate the, you it. You mean with the autonomous? Yeah, yeah. yeah with, we're with very data. early. Do we're very early doors on the whole. The move towards autonomy is going to uh, autonomous networking is going to require an awful lot of um, evolution of the systems already there. But I think they're starting to realise that. You know, they can do the next three or four years of implementing virt uh, virtualization capabilities and having, uh, you know, uh, SDN controllers and uh, orchestration software. But at the end of the day, if they don't actually, they've re they're yeah. starting to realize now, if they don't actually know what they've got, then all of that is pointless. Totally. 
Uh, but currently, when they if, if if they employ a, I was speaking to a vendor the other day who said, well, when we engage with a new company and we're going to upgrade their network, the first thing we need to do um, is find out, you know, what's currently out in the network, and they physically have to do yeah. it. It's there's it's no it's inventory. There's no spreadsheet. Well, there are. There's like they they usually end up with, oh, here's a database, but then here's some spreadsheets, and then yeah. he, here's a big paper plan that unfolds over a whole table to show what we think we have in this particular neighborhood yeah. because we bought that company five years ago and we're still not Never sure really what integrated we bought. It properly, yeah. And they actually employ these vendors then to spend three months and millions of dollars and thousands of man hours literally visiting their network to find out what the hell they've got. That There's got to be a better way. So is that, I mean, does that transfer across to sort of like customer data as well? Customer data is um, easier to track and manage because it's constantly being Changing. updated. But there's, I mean, there are still issues there. It's easier to deal with. But for example, I've been a Virgin Media customer, NTL and then Virgin Media, for about 15 or 16 years. And only a couple of years ago did they stop sending me marketing information asking yeah. me if I wanted to be their customer. Indeed. Um, so it took them that long to realize I was already a customer and that they, they were wasting their money. So there's, there's a... There's a central paradox in all this. I was um, I was writing about uh, an Ericsson sort of autonomous car thing this week, and and there's a sort of Ericsson uh, quote they like to use about how something like 95 percent of accidents are due to human error, which stands to reason, really, doesn't it? it makes you wonder what the other five percent are. It's um, the people who get their dogs to drive the car. <laughs> they're just not reliable. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and 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 that's used as evidence of why AI is good, because we're basically a bit shit. We're a bit inefficient. We're easily distracted. We're chatting on our phone. We're, we're daydreaming about the next episode of Game of Thrones or whatever. Um, whereas good old computers, you know, they're 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 always on the job. They don't need to eat. They don't need to rest. They're one hundred percent efficient and all that sort of thing, which may or may not be true. But as you point out, Ray, we, we still need to program those computers. We still need to give them data. Yeah. Um, and you can have the, the most clever bit of AI, but if it's working with, with on, mm. on a flawed platform... Or it's given the wrong instructions. Well, indeed. Or it becomes autonomous and self-aware and decides to launch nukes. No, sorry, that's a, one of my tangents there. Um, so yeah, I mean AI. Is, I was I was looking when we think about this podcast. We've written about sort of three or four AI stories this week, and they seem to be coming uh, with greater frequency. And they all have this sort of utopian: everything's going to be great once we let the computers take over. Um, you know, we do. We did have one other thing. In fact, uh, we were chatting about this earlier. I might go off on this tangent. We were talking about AI replacing people in the workplace, um, and uh, and what an issue that is from 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 an HR point of view. Uh, and I, you know, that that's another one. So not only is AI supposed to be so flawless that you no longer need people, but then if you no longer need people, what are people going to do? Well, but at the same time, I mean, there's always going to be a there's always going to be a role for humans. Um, you know, everyone would have thought of this. Just not as many humans of, as well. Yeah. <laughs> everyone would have thought of this a couple of uh, thought the same thing a couple of hundred years ago. I mean, this is no this yeah, this is no different from us replacing like instead of us rowing a boat you know like uh across across the across the canal slash slash channel um <laughs> uh we're we're using a motor so we're i mean the the then this is the next step of evolution you know at that point it was replacing human muscles with machine and now we're replacing human mind with machine admittedly for mundane tasks I mean the next big thing is that when they can you know in god knows how many years when they actually manage to replicate the power of the brain mm. and they can start doing jobs that are beyond the mundane and start doing all include you know like journalism yeah shudder. like journalism although saying that I, I still think that there are a few titles well I'm not going to say who they are <sighs> Such a tease. <laughs> it's a few <laughs> titles that can probably be replaced by AI right now. <laughs> like, do you know? I actually wrote in a story today that um, ZT might consider using AI to write its press releases because they'd but, almost certainly do a better job. But yeah, anything that's generic. I'm not saying who the the, the news outlet is, but anything that's generic has zero yeah. um, analysis or opinion in it. I mean, a machine could do that. Yeah, you know, when it's just rearranging the words in the press release. Exactly. How do you know it isn't already? 
Yeah, um, might well be, might well be. Um, have you seen that writer for a while? <laughs> well, there. I mean, there's maybe they had their digital identity appropriated by a machine. Oh my God, it started. I think there's one massive title. Can I say it? Yeah, go on. Yeah, say it. I, what are you I mean, about? like you look at the majority of the news stories that are on the BBC website. I mean, they're just so beige oh, yeah. and fact, and it's informing. There's no opinion or analysis because you know it's a public service, so they can't lean left or right when it say. comes to politics or anything yeah. like that. So they still get accused of it, so they might yeah. as well. <laughs> but it's so matter of fact. A lot of their stories, like football reporting, it's so matter of fact. Hmm. You know that there's no reason a computer could do that. It couldn't do that. So so we've got this dilemma where, you know, I, I take your point about the Industrial Revolution. There's always been progress. There's always been automation. There's always been a desire to for greater efficiency, which basically means getting the same job done by less people. Yeah. Um, and we've found a way. Um, but I still think that there's some genuine concern, hopefully not for our profession right now, although our profession has all sorts of other challenges beyond automation. Um <laughs> But yes, as you say, the slightly more mundane, repetitive jobs, increasingly, you know, we see a lot of AI to do with uh, customer care and call centres and, and all that sort of thing. And let's not forget the call centres in, in a lot of, like the UK, for example, call centres are where people who who sort of fell out of primary or secondary, like going down, working down the mines or whatever, ended up getting retrained to go and work in call centres or something like that. And so that now that's being automated. What do they go off and retrain to do? So I think it's a, it's a genuine concern. It'll probably get sorted out. We don't want to get too hysterical, but I think oh, I people do. are entitled. I, I, I mean, I think there go are on, certain <laughs> lose your shit right here, right now. <laughs> I mean, there are certain jobs that yeah you can see uh, that are going to get replaced, but there's also qualified jobs that are going to get replaced, and I, don't, I think that'll shock people. Yeah, like bookmakers. Or clerical staff. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, they reckon they're in quite statty. Firms or accountants, like that. Uh, insurance underwriters, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean that's, that could be that could be gone. A load of those, a load of those jobs could be wiped out. Yeah, uh, the trend I see at the moment is that, um, major companies who have very large headcounts are trying to persuade the world currently that the introduction mm -hmm. of automation is not going mm -hmm. to impact jobs, and yeah. that is they'll still have the same number of jobs. No, they won't. It's just their well, they're bullshit. Create, they're creating new jobs. They will create. They will create some. Yeah. But not as many as they will get rid of. They just don't want to scare the workforce currently, and they they're not doing a very good job at convincing the world that this is, this isn't going to have an impact on headcount. I think they need to be a bit more well, that's upfront a, about it. That's what the. I mean, it's the it's perfect PR work really isn't it they're saying don't worry ai will create these jobs and so you know and we're doing a bit to retrain our current staff mm. but 90 percent of the time the person who's doing the mundane job that's going to be um sort of replaced by the machine they're not going to be an ideal candidate for the data scientist job which has been created um you know so like you said yeah they're it's not like for they're light. glossing over. They're, that's what I mean. And like you said, they don't want to scare them too much. And I think it's partly because they don't really know. Because you know, for a lot of, if you're a very very large company, yes, there might be people who aren't suitable to be retrained. But that also, you know, the introduction of automation might give some very large companies the opportunity to branch into a new area of business that they're not currently in, using their existing workforce. And it depends then how they plan that efficiently and um, if they have a very good training uh, plan in place. But I'm not sure anybody has at the moment, but yeah. large companies will be looking at this and thinking, do we want to get rid of a whole load of people? How much would that cost us? Is they, what, are the, what is the opportunity here maybe to develop new areas of business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, you know. But people, people are generally like stupid money. and they probably won't. But they're, Yeah, but they're, they're people who like to make money. So you give them That's what the it's opportunity. All about. Let's not forget, this is what it's, this yeah. is what it's only about. Nobody look, really gives a damn. And you look at sort of quarterly earnings calls and that sort of thing, uh, quite often the thing they're most proud about is greater efficiency and lowering overheads and all that sort of thing. Great quarter, guys. Can you give me some more colour on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we made a bunch more people completely redundant through that machine in the corner there. And I will invest in your stock. Excellent. I'm happy. I'm a happy capitalist. Um, cool. Okay. Well, that's sort of slightly ominous. No, well, I, I, I think I'll just sign off by saying, hopefully, they will never come up um, with a computer that can 
replicate three people talking shit in a room. On that note. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and until then, see you next time. <laughs>